Hi everyone, uh, welcome to State of Play with Brandon Bales. I'm Brandon Bales, of course, your host as always, and I've got someone very special with me today. Uh, I've been enjoying his latest game a lot lately, and um, he's just a, a, in general um, a, swell. a swell feller. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's Edmund McMillan, so uh, Edmund, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me here. Of course. To the show. To the show. <laughs> in your own home. Your show's pretty cool. Oh, thanks. Looks, looks pretty, the set looks great. Oh, oh, well, thank you. Yeah, we have, uh, we did a lot of, uh, it's the production designer. He, he gets paid a lot you splur of You splurge on, splurge on the Legos. Oh, yeah. It's nice. Nice touch. Hmm, thank you. Nerf guns, too. <laughs> we got it all. Um, if uh, you are unaware, uh, Edmund has worked on uh, many, many games of the past uh, decade and a half, almost, I think. And uh, most recently, of course, uh, Super Meat Boy. And The Binding of Isaac. Yes. Um, which have been really big hits for you. Surprisingly, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's so cool. And um, oh, and, but of course, more, even most recently is Indie Game the Movie. E yeah. Which uh, which is on Steam and. Yeah, which is which is odd to think of as like an achievement in a way because like, <laughs> I'm not. It's not my movie. Right. Right. <laughs> right. He just yeah. appears in it. I appear. I appear in it though. <laughs> I'm a character in a movie. <laughs> Well, let's since you since you said that, I have to ask because I want to talk about this movie. Um, do you feel in watching it that that is is a documentary? Do you feel that you are a character in it, or in some way? Yeah, it's it was really weird. I remember going in, and you know, when they when they were actually filming, you always think to yourself like. You know, will will this one be the one that like me? Because around the time that they started, there it was they were actually like the fourth film crew that came to my house to film a documentary about indie games. There was quite a few. There's like one for PBS. There was one that was actually done by like Game Pro. It was a Game Pro one, and then the uh, an Australian one or no? It was actually uh, yeah, and uh, just like kept coming and going, and and when they came, they, there was something about them that was kind of like. It seemed like it seemed like they would get it done. It seemed like they were just really passionate about it, and just really into it and excited about it. And they seemed to be excited about games in general. Um, but when they started, I, of course, you're just thinking, oh yeah, no, they're they're recording interviews. You know, maybe they'll cut something together because the original thing that they did with Ala Coloca in Canada was like this little this little ten minute piece that was just on online. And you know, you think like, oh, they're trying to do a movie, but what will happen? Who knows? Like, what will they get the footage that they want? But they basically came in and said, "Hey, we're we're going to do this documentary about indie games, and we're interviewing like twenty different developers. You want to be one of those people? We're, it's going to be like they wanted. They were they pitched it as like the objectified of indie games, where we're just going to be little vignettes of all these different developers talking about the process. And I was like, "Yeah, cool. That sounds good." And uh, you know, once stuff got further, I started to realize. That this could be much bigger than I expected, um, but never when it was like really happening. It was just they were almost they almost turned into just you know friends that came over and right. and, and talked to you while you were going through this crap that was just not that fun and <laughs> and and you got to kind of vent a little and um, but I never you don't I wasn't prepared for it. It's like those those of you who've seen the movie, there's like at the end of the movie like where I'm talking about how I feel about everything. Mm -hmm. I, like all I can say is it feels good, it feels cool cuz I don't have like I don't have the words. You know, they, they don't exist. And the words that I was looking for now are is that it's life-changing. It feels life-changing. Mm -hmm. And it's basically the same thing now where this documentary coming out again is life-changing for me in a completely different way. Like <clears throat> There's positives and negatives, of course, that yeah. go with these things. And it's weird to be a character in a movie hmm. because I am a character in a movie. Like, it's just a tiny sliver of my existence that's, re that's recorded in this movie. Like, it only shows a smidgen of my personality, which is obscured by this level of stress that I'm under in that point in time. Like, um, and I, I don't, and even though, like, and like I, I should complain because I'm not, 
I'm not somebody in the movie that people bash usually. Like it, no one, no one, you know, Fish gets a lot of guff and sure. then John is, you know, pretentious and then <laughs> Tommy's never happy. And I'm touted as this like jolly, always smiling, you know, kind faced, gentle giant. These are all quotes. Gentle giant. Gentle giant. Come on. Dude. I'd like to think it was like genital giant. <laughs> and they just. <laughs> but no, it, uh, it's odd for me to read that. As all of us, I'm sure, read this and like, oh, this is a caricature of me. But like, that's, if if you came across anybody that's ever known me and said, oh, Edmund, he's always he's always happy. Like, oh, that guy, he's just a blast to be around. He's always happy, always smiling, a gentle giant. Um, <laughs> they would think, you know, you're crazy. No one would describe me that way. And it was weird to have people who see me at that point in time, I guess I came off that way because I was just so overwhelmed with the stresses of what was going on that I just didn't care anymore. I just went limp and let it carry me where, wherever it would. And I was just going through hell at the time and I was just, that's just how I dealt with it. You know, I make a joke, laugh it off because, you know, the moment I start taking it seriously, I'm going to become exactly like Tommy or exactly like Phil and I was... Like I was all the all the people in the movie. I went through all those motions in development, but at those last two weeks of development release that they kind of were focused on in the movie, I was just losing my fucking mind. Like I was, I, my whole life, like everything, like I was risking everything, and it was all coming to a head. And and like like I was telling you before, I was talking to Andy from Spelunky on on Skype earlier and like he's going through the same thing and like it's just there still aren't words like all you can say is it's a life-changing event but it's just it's more stressful than the movie makes it appear sure. like <laughs> there there are just so many aspects of the movie that that of course couldn't you know the movie would be two weeks long you know <laughs> to get to get the full full idea of exactly what happened they they did a really great job um, with the film, but it, it is very odd to have this crucial and life-changing moment uh, cut down to you know like twenty minutes or whatever, and then have people react to it. Now it's core; it's all it's all positive, and I'm not not complaining, really. But it's so odd. Yeah. Like it's so odd, and especially odd when you know you can, I have like people stopping me on the street and saying, "I saw any game in the movie. Good work," and it's like. <laughs> I don't know. I, I like. I don't know how to respond to you. Like, I don't know how to respond to that because I didn't do anything. Like, you're just watching me. Right. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's, it's not. It's. It was weird. It's it's weird in a way. It's like struggling with ego and that sort of stuff too. Where, like, I went into this, and of course you got to have a certain amount of ego in order to go into you know anything and like. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm you know I'm a designer and blah blah blah. I wrote about myself, <laughs> and you need a little you need to you know a little bit of that in there in order to really go. But it was pretty odd to you know come off of the success of of Meat Boy and then the success of this movie and being painted in a positive light and not having it trying to not have it affect my ego in a negative way because I felt myself like searching for meaning in um, respect like public response mm -hmm. it's just a, it was a broken thing yeah. and then finding myself like wanting you know looking up conversations people are having with me which is it, it's none of my business and it's just one of those things that like I remember in high school thinking I wish I had some sort of device that like I could just type in my name and then like see what conversations people are having about me in school because I want to know what people are thinking and like it's not it's one of those be careful what you wish for situations because the moment you start seeing that stuff, you know, sure, it's it's good when people are saying positive things, and they do, but um, it's always the same. The negative things, even though they're not as common, stick with you. And it's not even the negative things, it's just the odd things. Like I was saying, like being, char like being called a gentle giant and stuff like that, and then we would really, hey, don't call me that. But <laughs> it, it's it's this weird obsession with yourself, and I got really sick of hearing about myself mm. and talking about myself. 
<laughs> and <laughs> I'm doing it now. <laughs> but um, I'm more comfortable talking about my work and less about myself. And with the movie, it was weird to have people gearing the questions towards me. Like, right. odd. It was odd. But it got to the point where I was realizing it was actually having a negative effect on my creativity and I had to cut it off. So I cut off any kind of two-way interaction with the public. Like, I, I cut off Twitter. I cut off Facebook. I cut off Google Alerts. I cut off, cut off AIM, Skype, you know, everything that I had public before because I felt like I needed to in order to talk to the fans, put myself out there to show that I was a real person, um, kind of bit me in the ass a bit. Mm -hmm. And I had to chop it off in order to stay productive. And since I have, and, and I've been focusing on other work like Binding of Isaac and stuff that I have coming out now, and it's been very helpful to cut that away. And it's a, an odd alien struggle to fight this weird dark ego which I don't want yeah. <laughs> like I never I never I never set out to be some cool dude in a movie you know yeah. and it's really odd to complain about <laughs> <laughs> but it's just not something I set out to do like I set out to be the guy behind the curtain right you know uh, and you know I know I put myself in this situation and I wanted to talk about my work but it's very weird to be in an uncomfortable space I'm not used to dealing with this and I don't really know how. Yeah. I'm just improvising around it and I can see pockets of dangerous area that I need to stay away from. Hmm. But when it comes down to it, it's just a reminder for me to just realize that I'm here to make games yeah. and kind of stay behind the scenes. Hmm. I'm willing to talk about what inspires me to work because I want to inspire other people. Hmm. Um, but that's as far as it goes. <laughs> that's funny. We. On the way up here to film this interview, we uh, were talking about the same thing. Was, we were listening to Weezer, you know, and it's like, oh, Weezer, you know, the Blue Album. Oh, man. What oh, happened? Pinkerton? Yeah. What, what Pinkerton happened? was an amazing it's, it was album. It so great. And like, Rivers Cuomo, man, he lost it, you know, and then it's, and we had this big conversation about how he stepped out of the public eye and blah, blah, blah. And I can't even imagine how that must be for people at this point. I mean, because even then, I mean, that's what... 15 years ago now. Yeah. And that, like, there wasn't even, there was a lot less stuff online about people, you know, and, that, and now it's... Yeah, I could only imagine now. Like, and I, you know, I heard that whole thing when he, you know, made Pinkerton and then it bombed and was completely destroyed by it and then basically decided to separate. It seems like, and I'm not bashed to Weezer's new music, but, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like he, the only way he could deal with it was stop writing such personal stuff. Sure. And, and kind of tread away from the really artistic value that he had in his original work. And, but it makes sense because he couldn't deal. Yeah. Like he just couldn't deal with putting himself out there and letting people take advantage of it. Mm. Which is, it's, you know, it's definitely in, I think, most artists who have a self-destruct button somewhere. <laughs> and at some point it gets pressed. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Well... Um, we will leave that button uh, in a mysterious place for now. I don't want to find. I don't want to know where that is. I'll stay. I'll stay in my fucking castle, <laughs> and no one will. No one will bother me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm happy. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> You're just a gentle giant. I know. <laughs> Always happy. <laughs> Uh, I'll just say a little bit more about the film and uh, divorcing you from it. Um, I'm happy that it exists, and I'm happy that um, it was so, it was so well made, and and uh, and I hope that if whatever they do next, it'll be successful as well. Of course, I'm I'm really looking forward to all the footage that they basically cut in order to make this movie. You said there were 20, so there were 17... 20, 20 developers. Right. Like, I don't even know how much they want me to reveal of what they're doing now, right. but they've got more, they've got more planned. Wow. But, yeah, like, like, like we were talking about earlier, like, they, they, they pitched that to me, like, this is the movie and this is how it's going to be, and then when things kind of got closer to release, I think they said they started to, they were like, you know, we want to come back up and interview you again. And I'm like, okay, and we want to, we want to film you during release week. And I'm like, oh my God. And that was like, I was like, I don't even know how I could deal with people being in the house. But luckily, like I said, they're just so, 
they're just really, really nice. And like they, they both have the ability to fade away into the background, which I guess is a really good talent to have when you're a documentarian. Um, and they totally did. Like, like I was saying, I, I don't remember, I don't remember the cameras that they used. Like, I don't remember the cameras. Like, I remember them, but I don't really remember the cameras. And I know they had multiple cameras set up, <laughs> but I don't remember them. I remember one that slid around. It looked like it was on a ruler. But um, yeah, around that time, they were like, oh, "We think we know what the movie's about now." And I'm like, "What is it about?" And they're like, "It's about." It's about your guys' process. It's about the. It's about there's a story arc that's appearing here, and we want to capture this. And it's, it's weird to see people like being critical of the movie in really odd ways. There's always the whole like, it'd be better if this. It'd be better if that. But the most common question I think people ask, um, in a negative way, is why do they only focus on successful developers? Like it would have been nice to see somebody fail. And, in all honesty, I think they kind of expected Phil to be that story, Whoa. you know, because he kind of was the cautionary tale. Mm. At that point in time, that was a year ago, I didn't think Fez was going to come out. Mm. Like, there was as many times I get emails from him and he's like, checked out completely, I'm done, like, I'm not working on it. I just get emails from Renault saying, you know, we're still trying to put this together, but, but Phil's, we don't know where Phil is, you know, like, <laughs> so oh. they, I guarantee you that they, no one expected Fe Fez to come out. Like, you know, the movie cut off and then a year after the movie stopped her filming, then Fez came out more than a year later. Right. And, but people like see, and like, they were like, well, they knew Meat Boy was going to be a success. It's like, no, <laughs> we didn't. We, we were told repeatedly by Microsoft that it really wasn't going to be a success because it was projected lower than the other games that were in our, in our, in the game feast. And those games came out and did really terribly. So like, by the time we're, when they were filming us, we were under the impression that we were going to sell poorly. And we were really scared, and that's why we overcompensated for it. And I really like hit the press really hard, like tried to make sure everybody knew about the game as much as I possibly could, like pulling out the stops, every contact that I've ever had, saying, you know, here's a code, review the game. We'll do interviews. We were offering interviews and podcasts to anybody who asked, hmm. including little kids. Like we did, we did, <laughs> we did multiple, <laughs> we did multiple podcasts. Um, with little kids, there was one young guy who, I think he had some mental problems, but like, we wouldn't, we wouldn't not, we would do it. Like we, we, we would do it. We would do anything and everything to try to secure some, some amount of success with this because we had risked so much and we were just so frightened because Microsoft's telling, you know, you're going to sell as much as Hydrophobia and Comic Jumper is going to outsell you. Like, we were told this. And then Hydrophobia comes out and sells 3,000 copies in a week. And you're like, oh my God. Like, all of my life savings is in this. I'm like, all of Tommy's money is gone. At this point, Tommy was borrowing money from me that I didn't have. <laughs> like, in order to, like, stop the, the, in order to get, like, there's a, there's a story that we used to tell. I haven't told this one in a while where, Tommy went to the store and bought a Coke Zero and it ended in an overdraft fee of $800 because he kept going and buying Coke Zeros every day and they never contacted him because he lived in North Carolina and he was over here <laughs> and they weren't calling the right place and like he just kept racking up overdraft no. fees until it was like negative $800 and I remember the day he was like in tears saying I have no money it's over like it's over and it's like oh my god like and that's of course that stuff wasn't filmed but like, it gives you a bit better picture of the movie and exactly why we were at that point, especially him. Because he was at a breaking point, majorly. And it was so hard to hear him and see him like that and not be able to pick him up. And you know, that's why I, was, I wanted, I wish that he would have been with me when it, when it all happened because he was so fucking far away and all I could do was Skype with him and it was depressing. But we'd have this like thing where one of us would be down and the other one would bring us up and vice versa. And usually what happened is if I was the one that ended up down at the end of the night because I'd pe be pep, pep, pep talking Tommy all, all, all night and saying, you know, everything's going to be great because he's really down. And then finally I was like, oh, okay, I guess things are going to be great. And then I hit the bedroom and I'm like, I don't think things are going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think I've just been lying to Tommy and then I have to tell Danielle and Danielle has to bring me back up. Mm -hmm. talk, talk me off the roof mm -hmm. is what usually happened at night when... You know, we were bouncing off each other and 
you know, I'm the whole time telling Tommy, oh, it's going to be great. And then he's slowly convincing me it's not, but I'm lying and saying, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be great. And then I get to the bedroom and I'm dwelling on like all the what ifs. It got to the point too where John would say like, you guys are going to be millionaires. And I'd be like, what the, don't say that. (laughs) Like, don't fucking say that. (laughs) Don't say it with such like, he just said it in a way that was just so matter of fact that makes it seem like I was going to let everybody down. I was going to let everybody down. I was going to let my mom down, my sister down, like all these people who thought that I was going to succeed, all of them were let down. And then what did I do? I pulled Tommy into this mess. Like I pulled Tommy who's a diabetic and going through all this stress. And what am I doing? Like why did I do this? And I, you know, risking my relationship with my wife and it was just so much stuff on the line. It was just so fucking stressful. And, but what I'm basically getting at is that we didn't know the game was going to do well. There's no way to know if the game's going to do well. I'm sure there's many people out there who think they're going to do fucking great. And it comes out and they bombs. But like, we wanted it to do well. <laughs> of course we did. We put everything we possibly could into it to try to make it do as good as it possibly could. Um, but there was no way of knowing. And there was no way of the filmmakers knowing. They, they of course hoped. You know, fingers crossed. But in reality, I'm sure they had their, you know, they were open to whatever. Because at the end of the day, if we bombed, they still have a great movie. You know, they, they've got somebody failing. Like, which is what a lot of people say that they wanted. Um, but yeah, I think it, it was just chance, it was just chance. Like, of course they didn't predict the future and know that Super Meat Boy and Fez were going to just come out and do amazing. There was a chance that both games would never see the light of day. You know, there, was, <laughs> there were a few times where we got calls from Microsoft saying, you know, there's a possibility that someone's thinking about pulling the plug because of something you guys said or did or... Mm. Yeah, but... You go through that sort of stuff. What are these projections? How in the world does... One project? Yeah, how does Microsoft project this shit? Bullshit. <laughs> it's, it's, this is what you go to business school for, kids. Learn how to lie. <laughs> um, it's true. I, I have like a scale. It says, it's like this little graph. It says art on one side and business on the other side. And then under it is honesty for art and lies for business. Yeah. And that's the scale for games. Like leans towards one or the other. Like the further you get towards art, the closer you get towards honesty and purity. Mm. But the business involvement, I think, is the only thing keeping games from really being art, like yeah. full art. And they are art, but I can understand why there's an argument. Because it's hard to argue that Angry Birds is art. <laughs> you know, it's a business thing. It's really hard to argue that like Farmville is art. It's not, mm. it's business. The closer you get towards business, the more you get towards lies and manipulation. It's just um, a fact. It's a sad, sad fact. But yeah, that's what that's what they do. They, I don't know what they, I don't know how what kind of world they come from. But these business people, I envision them business marketing people in a room sitting around saying, "Okay, we've got this game feast coming up," and this was quite literally what we were told. Um, we think Super Meat Boy will do okay, but it'll do maybe on par with Hydrophobia, but Comic Jumper is going to do better because it's 3D. And I guess they have some sort of statistics that show that 3D games... It's just like, oh my god, it seems so moronic. Like, mm-hmm. like how do you just categorize a game as 3D? Like, why don't you categorize a game as good or bad? <laughs> like, like, it's not a fucking slight to the creators of those games, but the reason why those games didn't do good or do well is because they weren't that good. They weren't horrible, but they weren't that good. And like, I I could see it from a mile away. And like the whole time I remember we're at, Tommy's at E3 and he's like, yeah, Hydrophobia has got like three booths and and, and then Comic Jumper's got like another three booths and we had one single booth there and we had to beg for. And, And he's like, I don't think they were that good. And like, and this was around the time where we were getting these kind of projections and it was, purely because they were 3D. That was all we were told. 2D is out right now. <laughs> and 3D is in. It just doesn't make any sense when it's like all about the games that like do well. The funny thing is, is they're like, our producer is a genius and he's like the best producer there at Microsoft. He's the guy who like, he's the, who's the producer of Braid, Castle Crashers and like the, all the good wow. indie games. Like he knows his shit. It's like, why don't they listen to this guy? Wow. Why isn't this guy the one that's controlling? What's his name? I don't even know if I should. Well, his name's Kevin. Okay. <laughs> he's great. I mean, I'm not, I can I can name names of the guys. Great. The guy was great. He's the only redeeming factor of any business interaction with Microsoft 
actually Paul too. I mean, they're, 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 our team of like creative type uh, producer people that we dealt with were really great. It, it, it sucks that everything was so tainted by business and marketing. It was so tainted by business and marketing. Like, and it was just out of their hands because the people that control the money control everything. And if it's, it, they just put their foot down and they get what they want. And it's kind of funny, like a night and day situation of dealing with Microsoft and dealing with, with Valve. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, Valve, the core of Valve, at least it hasn't been corrupted by the business side of things. But, or their business side of things is actually intelligent and progressive, which is true. They know the internet, they know what they're doing, they understand how to work it. They're doing a really amazing job and they know where the money is and where the creative, they know the money is where the creativity is and they know to allow people to just do what they do and do it well and then they will publish it and put it out there and they don't get in your way, in any way. Like they don't even, you don't even need ESRB to be on Steam. Like it's just, it's just amazing. They don't, they cut out all the useless bullshit. Like you don't need ESRB, you don't even need to localize your games for other countries. It's like going, they, going through them with Microsoft, they just have a, like a really old way of thinking. It's probably just because there's a bunch of old business people there. Sure. And it's just not a progressive way of doing things. Like, not being able to control your sales. Like, we cannot. Like, we had, we had to beg and plead for a sale and it took a year to get one uh -huh. on, on, on Microsoft. Like, we, I could email Steam tomorrow and say, is there any openings for any sales? I want to lower the price on this date. And they'll be like, cool. You control your price. It's your game. It's not even a thing. And then they just... You can even put it in yourself. Like it's all automated. It's all there. Like you could do as many achievements as you want. I was just talking to, like I said, Andy about Spelunky, and he was telling me about some of the achievements that they got. And I was kind of surprised that Microsoft allowed them to do these achievements because, well, obviously things have changed since I was there. Because they, they told us that we needed easier achievements, <laughs> and they basically, you know, said, nope, we're not letting you do these hard achievements. You get X amount of achievements. I think it was twelve, maybe ten, and uh, they can't be. They need to be even like, uh, you know, a third easy, a third medium, and a third hard. You know, like, it has to be that way and it can't be all hard. And I was like, oh my God, well, that's the point. You can't argue with these people. It's like, I try to explain, like, what an achievement is <laughs> and, and, and the reason why you shouldn't get an achievement for doing something that you're expected to do. Like, I hate achievements that you get that are just progressive. Right. Like, I beat chapter one. No shit. Yes. Like, yeah, I, I, everybody too. did. <laughs> like, exactly. good, good job. Like, yeah. you, you started the game. Like, wow, that's great. Like, way to really use the word achievement in an incredibly incorrect way. And it also, it, it, it takes away from uh, the, the progress of the game and the enjoyment of it. You know, you, I feel like it, I've been playing Mass Effect 3 recently. I'm a little late to the boat. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it keeps popping up on the side of the screen. It says, you know, 25 out of 50 did something. You, you know, 35 out of 70 you did something. I'm like, what? who cares? Like, I just want to play the game, man. I don't care how far along in getting an achievement I am. You just gave me a mini achievement towards the macro achievement. It, I hate it. No, yeah, it's, it's, it's really odd. And a lot of times it actually detracts from things because it seems like, I don't know, I, I just think achievements should be there to do something that asks you to go in a different direction than the game requires normally. Sure. Like, if you do things differently. Like, it's really, like, you can use it in a game design sense where, you know, you're asking the player to do something that goes above and beyond what is required for the game and you achieve something by doing that. That's what achievement's for. But, <laughs> what are you gonna do? Gonna do? It's, it just becomes this like business formula where it's like people like achievements so add them. Yeah. People, that's what it is. Like business people sat down and said people like achievements. Hmm. We, should, um, we should make it so it's really easy to get them. Because <laughs> people like that. And then yeah. it'll just like, be, it's like I don't want to use shitty abusive manipulation to get people to finish my game because like if you play through it again you're gonna get an achievement like it's just horrible art. but that's business that's, <laughs> that's the that's that's the opposite of, of art and that's the opposite of, of making a game and designing a game that's just all business stuff that goes along with the, the territory yeah. and um, that's the difference between you know old thinking and new thinking I guess progressive thinking yeah um, well, so let's uh, let, let's go back. Uh, to way the, back. Let's go way back, brother. Um, to the very beginning, and because what I'm interested in is 
Um, I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of all the, your games that are, that appeared on. Um, or I shouldn't. I haven't played them all. That's a, that's me. <laughs> I'm a jerk. Um, uh, I've been a fan of you know of uh, the the three or four games I played off from Newgrounds that you did for, throughout the years. Yeah. Um, and that was really cool, and those are great. Um, so how? So where where does it come? Um, specifically, like. Making freeware for a long time. How did how how did you meet Tommy? Uh, and how did you how did it come about that? Hey, we're gonna make a big push. Like when did it go from freeware to? Yes. When when did you when did you set your sights on Xbox Live, etc.? Well, I mean to go back a little further. Mm-hmm. I got I started making flash games in like two thousand. Yeah. And I didn't even know I was making games. You know, I was just making, making like interactive Flash stuff. And at the time, it was like there was the internet was really cool, like really creative and new. And there was um, they called it the EN scene, the everything nothing scene. It was a zine scene. I don't know how old you are, but in the nineties, <laughs> back in the nineties, these great the great nineties. All the all the little kids out there, are gonna, you don't even know, man. It was way way better than the sixties. The, uh, in the the awesome early '90s, um, there was these things called zines, which were just little magazines that that people like copied at Kinkos, right. and and you could they could be comics, they could be fanzines about right. musicians you like. They could, it was the internet, right? But it was in these little little magazines, right. and those people who made those zines transitioned into the internet, learned how to do all this stuff. Usually writers, and they started the EN scene, which was basically. Um, like a web ring of these creative websites. And some of them had interactive Flash games. And one of the big ones was a site called Newgrounds, which not many people realize that Newgrounds um, is Neo Neo Geo translates to Newgrounds. Hmm. And Newgrounds was a fanzine that Tom Fault made in real life and then turned it into a fan site for Neo Geo stuff that he... Obviously, he was a rich kid because <laughs> those those things were like six hundred dollars Neo Geos back then. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew of like one kid who had right? one. He was uh, wealthy, but yeah. So Tom made these zines, tr- made the transition up. I also made zines, made the transition up. I had a, I had a, uh, a zine called "This Is a Cry for Help." Hmm. Actually, have it up here. Show, show, show. <sighs> Look at this. Oh, kids. Oh, Hello, kids. Flash oh. from the past, flash from the past. This is how we did it. All right, this is a dick, so I don't know if you want me to show this, but show, I don't the, know. Dick. show the dick. So, <laughs> so this is this is the comic, right? <laughs> and all, all the sheets of it, and it would basically fold in like that, and uh, uh, you'd fold it in half after you make the copies, and you staple it and put it up. But yeah, um, and this was issue two. Of this is a cry for help. It doesn't have my cover on it. I don't know where it is. But I took that and turned it into this is a cry for help.com. Could you show us again real quick? I'm sorry. This is just a, just a little Maybe I find the. Where's the. Cool. Now I'm going to close your shot of that a little later. Yeah, you could feel free to do whatever. This <laughs> <laughs> one has a little Jesus in it. That's great. But yeah, I. Me and many other, you know, zinesters, which I guess was hip back then. I, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't aware, but uh, made the transition to the internet and started making these cool creative things. And Tom Fulp was one of the first to take this Flash, which was a, a website tool that you could do like minor animations with. Like you could, when you mouse over, you can have a thing explode, right. you know. And uh, it was very flashy, which maybe that's where it comes from but (laughs) and uh tom figured you know he could make games with it and i think the first game that he made was called pico school and it was like an adventure game point and click adventure type game with some minor other video game interactivity in it and it was just like what like (laughs) that is fucking cool like that is just so awesome so i wanted to learn flash 2 and by 2001 i was making these things called dead baby dress up (laughs) Which, uh, which was just basically like this little blue doll that you pull clothes over and you could like customize it however you wanted. And, 
And that's like what my site was known for. And the funny thing is, is Tommy also had a site called Tommyism. Uh. And Tommyism, he had little games as well. One of them was called Bitch Hunt, um, which is like, it's Duck Hunt, except you shoot his ex-girlfriend <laughs> and like, he puts her in a wood chipper. It was, it was great. And he had one called like Nail Jesus to the Cross, where you like throw nails at Jesus while he's on the cross. But yeah, we were all, you know, early, early 20s, 19, 20 years old. And uh, making these little interactive games. And it was, there was never a thought of like, could I make a living off of this? It was like, this is fun. Like, this is fun. And not only is it fun, but suddenly I'm going from like 20 people around town reading my work to hundreds of thousand people around the world reading reading and, and experiencing all this stuff. And it was just really cool. And I started transitioning all my comic themes and stuff into interactive animations. And by 2002, I started, I, I paired up with a programmer um, named Calder Bradford. And we started working on this series of games called The Badlands. And me and Tom were actually working on a game too together. And this was before Alien Hominid. He actually had to quit working on Alien Hominid, or quit working on the game that I was working on because he was working on Alien Hominid. He's like, I think I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make a console game. Like, I'm like, what, really? And he's like, yeah, I think, I think we're gonna like sell it in stores and stuff. And that was when he began his little adventure. So when he broke off and started doing that, and I was like, you know, there's something to this here. You know, this, I didn't even know it as the independent game scene mm -hmm. by 2002 or 2003. But I found out about this company when I was looking for work called Chronic Logic. And they were just down the street from my house, like with two blocks from my house. And I went in there and I'm like, I met him and I was like, hey, you know, I'm a freelance artist. And like at the time I was doing like magazine covers and for local magazines and zines and stuff like that. And whatever art I could do to make, make a little bit of cash. And I was like, I'll volunteer my time, you know, you know, give me, give me a job. And I did some box art for him and stuff like that. And they hired me on, I think I was making 400 bucks a month and uh, doing box art for him. And, uh, and other 3D stuff. For video games? What, what was for it? video games. They, um, they, they were known for a game called Bridge Builder. Okay. It's a very old <laughs> physics-based game. Okay. It was like, it was, I had played it, so I had known of it. Like, <laughs> on the internet, it, was, it had a lot of popularity to it back then. Um, and it, I, I, it turned me on to a whole other scene. Like, this, this whole even more underground scene <laughs> of, like, these kind of basement developers who would make these crazy games and like they were like you ever heard of this thing called the independent games festival and i'm like no huh. they're like well it just started and last year we we won the audience award or whatever and we're gonna do it again and i'm like oh that's really cool and and i was like i, I think i went home that day and i was sketching some some character designs up and they were known for like physics-based games and i kind of like designed around that idea of making a physics-based game that was character driven mm -hmm. and I came up with Gish and just like the rough idea for Gish, I brought it in and, and I pitched it to them and they were like, okay, we'll, we'll, you know, try something new. And since it like was custom to my art and themes and stuff, I was able to just take it and run with it. And, you know, six to eight months later, the game was finished and we had entered in the IGF. Um, we lost that year, but then in 2005, we entered it again, the finished product, and we won the grand prize. Congratulations. So, yeah, so that was kind of like, my first IGF experience was just insane. Like having people come up and say, oh, I really like your work, I really love your game, and then seeing people play it, it was just like, whoa, this is just amazing. It was just like this total high from, from seeing that happen. And, and then, yeah, then the next year to win, it was just phenomenal. But in a way, it kind of crushed me because I felt like I had peaked. Uh. I felt like I had peaked really early in, in my career, and I felt lost for a good two years, like 2000. Six and seven, I had no idea what I was doing. And I was basically making crap. I wasn't making anything good. I was very lost. And the independent scene was growing. And it kind of hit critical mass at like 2008 when it boomed and like mm -hmm. suddenly, you know, Castle Crashers and stuff. Or I think that might have been, no, yeah, maybe 2008. Castle Crasher was like this huge, huge deal. And, and I'm seeing, you know, Tom do it, like making millions off of these things. And I'm like, you know, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing? Like, am I just gonna sit around in, in an office and just do nothing all day making shitty little games that I don't sell? Or am I gonna, you know, make something substantial? It was around the time when my grandma passed away and I kind of had this burst of inspiration that I felt like I needed to do something to like prove my worth and kind of push myself in a way. I needed to prove that I had some value and that I could do it. And 
that year was like the most productive year for me and I ended up making like a, six games that I all got sponsored so I was able to make I think I made like 30 grand off of sponsorships that year from all those games and that's the money I saved to make Super Meat Boy so it was I, I ended up making a lot of games that year like Coil mm-hmm. um, The C Word Ether, <laughs> Meat Boy, the original Meat Boy, would later make Spewer, Timefuck, like all this, my significant, you know, Flash games. Mm-hmm. And I put them all in like a compilation and I started sending them to everybody. Like I sent them to like just random people who would inspire me and I, and I contacted all the press that I could contact and they started writing it up and I started selling them. I had a thousand copies of them and they all sold out within a year and after that year was up, in 2009, I started getting emails, early 2009, from, from people like Nintendo and Sony and Microsoft saying, you know, you looking to do a console game? Like, I didn't really have the option to do a console game, but around that time I met Tommy. And Tommy had made console games before. That's what he used to do in a company. No kidding. Yeah, he worked for Streamline Studios, which was actually overseas. And um, he... He was a really, really good programmer. Is <laughs> like he's dead now or something. <laughs> oh, old Tom. Um, around that time, when Microsoft, Nintendo contacted, I'm like, I don't know, maybe Ether. Like maybe I'll do a sequel to Ether. I don't know. And then Microsoft is asking, and I'm like, I don't know, maybe Gish Two. Like maybe we'll do Gish Two. And I was still working with um, Alex, the, the the programmer for Gish, at the time, and he was down with it, but he needed another programmer to help him with the actual like putting it on console process because he never worked with consoles before. So that was where Tommy fit in. Like Tommy fit into the equation right there and they're like, hey Tommy, you know, we had made a little game together called Grey Matter in, in late late 2008 and he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll come down. He lived in the office and he stayed there for a few months to, to, to start working on um, the beta of GISH 2 so we could pitch it to Microsoft because they wanted it. Basically things went really sour there and nothing got done for whatever reason. And I, I was like, we gotta do something. Like, and then Tommy's like, well, what do you wanna do? And I'm like, well, let's, let's do Meat Boy. Like, people like Meat Boy, like, that would be, you know, it's, it didn't seem like we were biting off more than we could chew. Like, I had made a lot of platformers and I had a lot of experience with it. And it just seemed like it made sense. So we kind of pitched it to Nintendo, Nintendo wanted it. And then we pitched it to Microsoft, tried to like switch Gish 2 with it because I was no longer working with Alex and um, Gish 2 wasn't gonna happen. And they were very hesitant about it. And basically, like I said, our guy campaigned for us and, and put his name on the line and said like, no, this game's gonna do well. You know, I wanna, I wanna produce this game. And he believed in us enough to just back us and that was kind of it. But it was, it was just to that point, I think in 2008, where it's like all these people that I, grew up with like are suddenly breaking out and be getting huge and doing all these like dream games and I, I want I wanted that opportunity too and instead of just you know boo-hooing about my situation <laughs> I, I said okay well I'm gonna be realistic you know I haven't tried my hardest and I'm going to really try my hardest and see where that gets me and that was essentially it. I just made a deal with myself that I wasn't going to fucking pussyfoot around and just sit on my hands all day that I was going to work as hard as I possibly could and be as honest as I possibly could with, with what I was working on and only work on stuff that I really loved and felt passionate about and just see where, where it would take me. And that was, that was essentially that that's the whole progression of, you know, the 10 years of, of, of the, the core, the big years of, of my career. Mm. It was that transition up where it was like starting out as something that I loved, losing sight of what I wanted, finding it again, and remembering that I just wanted to do what I loved. And if there was an option that I could make a career out of it, I wanted to do that. You know, and I wasn't going to just sit around and be the kind of person who, you know, thought, what if, what if I tried harder and, you know, risked failure? Because a lot of people do, like a lot of people that I work with are very scared of, of the idea of failure. And they don't, it's much easier to not risk it and just not play the game because then you can't lose. You can't lose if you don't play the game. And 
and it's it's that kind of mentality that just puts you in a shitty loop of yeah. life <laughs> where where you're never happy and uh and I felt myself going into it and I knew I needed to pull myself out mm. that was basically it good on you man that's encouraging it's not easy yeah I wish I could I wish I could I wish I wish that there was some sort of documentary I could edit together of my memories that would show <laughs> the hardship so people can have a full understanding because there is there is a very discouraging illusion to success um, it's very frustrating to see and you see it so often and I think one of the reasons why so many people in the US are so depressed has a lot to do with what they watch um, and their idea of success and you know usually a success story you just hear the success part and you never you don't see the process and you think ah oh, man like it's that person got lucky and it was so easy for them like it looked effortless when you don't see like the grueling heartache the rejection the the loss you know and all the stuff that's sacrificed in the process you just see both oh, fucking million dollars you know out of nowhere and it's it's hard to uh fight that there's also the whole misconception of talent and talent is a word that people who are babies use to describe themselves having not talent in order to get away with doing nothing and being lazy <laughs> talent doesn't exist that's actually a lie um, you know it, it people who are good at things are good at things because they enjoy doing them and they get better the more they work and there's no such thing as somebody who's just born with this ability to do awesome stuff they might be born with the ability to enjoy doing something so much that they get good at it mm. but it is a stupid excuse I, you hear the word talent mostly used for people who are trying to find an excuse for why they're not happy with the situation that they're in because they don't have talent when it's just complete bullshit you get you, you get talent when you work on something mm -hmm. and get good at it it's, it's impossible that some kids never gonna pick up a guitar and start playing the guitar like he's you have to be taught and you have to learn and you have to do it a lot and in order to really get good at it, you have to enjoy it and I think that's the key factor like find something that you enjoy and focus on it and you will have the you will appear very, very talented yeah. <laughs> that's like it's just the way it goes yeah. yeah but there's a lot of stupid illusions in the world that I think really drop people down into depressed holes and feel like they can't get it can't get out of these holes because they're not talented they don't have the opportunities everybody else does you know or you know whatever else they convince themselves you know that the reason that they're in these shitty situations and I know this because I did it you know mm -hmm. because I was there too and there's just a point in time where you say I'm gonna actually try yeah. I'm not gonna say I you know claim that I'm trying I'm gonna actually do it and see and uh, I'd like to believe that if you just try your hardest you will get somewhere it may not be exactly where you want to be but it'll definitely be higher than where you currently are yeah. well since okay so after Meat Boy uh, did awesome it's my understanding that you wanted to make uh, a game and bind, the Binding of Isaac came to you and it was it was meant to be just kind of a kind of a, a lark yeah you know and but it became obviously it became bigger than you thought it might uh, in both oh yeah it became bigger than any idea I put into it like it <laughs> became bigger than itself <laughs> for sure because it was it was something that I intended for a very small audience like that was I don't ever go in thinking like who's the demographic here you know because then you start getting into that bad territory um, I make a, I make a game for myself and it's hard for me to not think logically and like what I like is a small amount of things and I tend to like weird stuff and it's I'm not a majority so I really sincerely believe that I was making a game for a small group of people like I was like an underground type you know midnight movie of video games or something mm -hmm. But, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. Like, it, there, it, there's just no, there's no reason for a game like that to sell so many copies. <laughs> it, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, it makes me feel great. It makes me feel great mostly because it's like, it seems like maybe the game, the game's themes and the, the game's style and the game's design have opened more doors for more developers to come through. Maybe more people will be more accepting of really odd or dark things. Um... And that's really great but I did not in a million years I did not expect that kind of response it, it seemed impossible but yeah it was a it was a game that uh, 
When I'm not being productive, I get really depressed sure. and I feel worthless. And I have to, I'm like a shark where I have to keep swimming or I die, you know, like, and I get to that point where if, if it's like the idle hand situation, like I start self-destructing if I've got nothing to make me feel valid. And it was around the end of, of, of Meat Boy development where Tommy was getting, talking about taking a vacation and I was like, I want to take a vacation, but I have a fear of travel, so I don't really travel. And uh, I'm like, I want to do something relaxing. I want to do something that'll make me feel good. And it was like, well, making games makes me feel good. I mean, I'm not going to, people are like, why would you, I just saw the movie and, and why would you put yourself through working like that again? And it's like, well, number one, it's not that situation anymore. <laughs> um, and I'm never going to repeat that again. But like, I love making games. Like, that's why, that's why I make games. Like, I'm in love with, <laughs> with making games. Um, and in a way, I was missing that. You know, it wasn't there anymore. And I'm trying to convince myself that I'm just like everybody else and I need to take a vacation and I need to get away from the computer and I need to get away from games and all this other stuff when the reality of the situation was that's what makes me happy and I'm not going to deny that. So I'm a workaholic. What the fuck? Like, it makes me happy to work. Like, that's that's my, you know, it's it, it's a good thing to have, you know, being addicted to working because, you know, you can be very productive. But the negatives, of course, it haunts you. It just doesn't leave. It doesn't let you sleep. It doesn't let you function. It doesn't let you do normal things. Um, it just haunts you and stays there. So in order to get that thing out, I have to sit down and work. And um, I contacted um, a friend of mine that I made games with in the past, Florian. Florian. Yeah, and I asked, hey, hey, you want to make a game jam in a week? You want to do like a little game in a week? And he's like, yeah, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> the funny thing is he didn't tell me that he was going... He was going broke. He's he, he's a very prideful person, and like he never told me that he didn't have any money until the very end of development. Where he's like, "Do you can I borrow any money off of the advance of the game because I don't have any money to pay my rent?" <laughs> and I was like, oh, "I'm like I had no idea. Like I knew that he hadn't made a, a game that was sponsored in a very long time and struggling that way, but I didn't know he got to that situation. And that's one of the things that makes me really happy that I was able to make this game that did really well with." somebody from the past who really helped my career and helped me and I could kind of, in a way, help him. Mm. And of course now he's sitting pretty, but uh, yeah, it was just, hey, let's make a game. Let's let's just, I don't know, what do you want to make? I don't know, I want to kind of make a roguelike game and I'll just sketch some stuff up tonight on paper and see what comes out and went upstairs to playing Zelda, saw like a really clear roguelike formula that could be applied to this to the dungeon structure and it was basically as simple as that. And then I just deconstruct from there. Like, I'm remaking Zelda in a roguelike formula. And then I'm just kind of thinking, like, well, what are the themes of Zelda? Like, what are the really underlying themes of the feelings? Mm. Like, Zelda always felt like like a, a, a lonely creative kid kind of exploring out. And, and right when, you know, when I was little, I used to always wander around out in the woods and stuff and, like, grab a stick, that's my sword, and, you know, chopping things up, turning over rocks and finding, you know, my mysterious things and right. stuff. And and Zelda really recaptured that, I think, big time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of wanted to go there, but from my experience, yeah. and in, in a lot of ways it's similar to Ether, where I wanted to explore the idea of a, a creative child, but I wanted to explore the the darker aspects of it. And that's how it kind of started. It's just like a, a dark, you know, inward, like the idea that maybe this is all happening in this kid's imagination and he's really obsessed with all this religious imagery and and because um, I was when I was little, like really morbid stuff and it all came from Catholicism, growing up Catholic and everything and and all that sort of stuff seeps in. And so I'm basically just pulling from my childhood and the dark aspects of being creative and um, what I experienced, and then it just started pushing more into the religion and more into religion and, and all the kind of dogma that, I, that was thrown at me growing up because I liked weird stuff and I played D&D &D and played magic and that sort of stuff too, and I was evil. Um, I, I, had, I had, you know, polarized sides of the family where I had my, my, my mom's side were all Catholic and then my dad's side were all born-again Christian. And his side was pretty extreme when it came to me, like going over there, they would take my cards away from me and tell me I was gonna go to hell and so on and so forth. So I wanted to like 
pull from that because it seemed to have some substance. And at the time I was also like really obsessed with the, like in the 80s there was like Christian propaganda going around about D&D being evil and whatever else. <laughs> it, if you look back it's very entertaining. <laughs> um, and uh, I just started pulling from that and just grabbing from all these different things and just like stuff that I wanted to talk about um, in an abstract way through game. Like I wanted to talk about religion, you know, negative effects religion could have on a child negative effects religion can have on a mother, mm -hmm. you know, negative effects religion could have on somebody who was confused about their sexuality, you know, all yeah. these all these different elements and how they could play into a kid with a vivid imagination. And uh, it just all bled together and it just seemed to just come out, just like, wow, oh, from all sides. It was like waking up with all these ideas that I wanted to put down and, you know, once I had them, you know, how could I intertwine them with this? roguelike formula that I was using and and how could I do all these things like I wish other games had done like I, I wish Diablo showed the items that I picked up on my character better right you know that sort of stuff too and like I just just went through my list of you know dream things in games and want to play a game that unfolds the more I play it you know the story just gets deeper and more abstract and and weirder and like I wanted the horseman of the apocalypse to appear. Like I you know, like all these grand ideas. I want the world to end. You know, I, I want all these mystical things that that I used to hear my mom and grandma talking about, the end of times and mm -hmm. demons rising from the ocean, all sort of stuff too. Like I wanted all that cool imagery that, that I heard when I was little. I wanted to come to life in in this game. And that's basically what, what happened. It just all came together in um fit together quite nicely and but you know I mean I'm sure you could see as describing it the way I did there's no way in hell I thought that a lot of people would like this <laughs> like <laughs> like this was something that I was going to be proud of I knew that I was very proud of a lot of stuff that I put into that game and um, but I never even set out to sell it like that's why it was made in flash it was never intended to sell it was just something that was going to be a game jam that was maybe never going to be released then I liked it too much and I kept working on it worked on it for for three months and you know, by the second month, it was like I'm, I'm showing it to other people. I think I showed it to John and um, Adam Saltzman and a bunch of other developers, and said, "Like, is this good? Like, would you pay money for it?" And they're like, "Yeah, well, oh my God, it's great! I pay ten dollars for that." And I'm like, "I don't know. Ten dollars seems like a lot for, you know, a flash game." And and I knew it wasn't going to run spectacular, and there was all these limitations that we had to work around, but. I wanted to put more into it because this was month two, and I like I wanted to justify the time spent. And I was like, okay, I'll I'll ask Steam what they think. I sent it to Steam. Steam loves it. I ask them what price do you think? Maybe five bucks. And they were like, five bucks is great. You know, you know, it was around the time where I think Dungeons of Dreadmore came out, and it was five bucks, and it seemed to just be a good price for something like that. I spent three months on it, so it's like okay, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> you know, I. I it, the funny thing was I actually considered selling it to Adult Swim for like 30 or 40 grand. Wow. That would have been a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, wow. yeah, I look back on that thinking, oh my God, like that would have been a huge mistake. <laughs> of course, I mean, of course Super Meat Boy helped the initial sales, sure. of course, you know. Yeah. But it, it is getting to the point now where people are like, I just found out you made Super Meat Boy. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> I, never, I never thought someone would fucking say that after after all the shit that happened with Super Meat Boy, like, um, yeah, it just kind of became this little phenomenon. It became this little mini Minecraft in a way where it just had this really diehard fan base who's just carrying the torch. Mm -hmm. Like, it's pretty unbelievable. Like, looking at this, this game, it's like, oh, it comes out. It's like, it basically looks like this sales-wise. Game comes out, and then... And then suddenly, four months later, what what's going on? You know, four four months later, wow. like what's what's happening here? Suddenly, it's like it's doubling, the sales are doubling, the sales are doubling, and now it's to the point where it's like quadrupling, and it's like it's almost been a year, and like it's just picking up this just steam, and it's just all, it's one hundred percent, all the fans, all the fucking fan art, mm -hmm. all like the let's plays that everybody's doing. It's just like breathing life into this. You know, endless game in a way, and 
it's cool. It was really cool to watch. It was it was cool to see it unfold, and uh, and it, it you know it really did start out as this like you know B movie type <laughs> midnight movie situation, <laughs> and then it became more of an odd little phenomenon, mm. which I'm you know very proud of. You got, a, got a lot of really cool response, and um, and again I can't help but be. I, I, I really get off on the idea of people being creatively inspired by anything that I do. Hmm. That's just like really, it's more redeeming than the money right. or the praise. It's just like, that's like such a genuine, like you could say, best game I've ever played, 10 out of 10. And then somebody could like, some little girl could draw a picture of Isaac and it's like, well, you just got bested by a six-year-old girl. <laughs> like, like this just has so much more weight to it. It makes me feel so much better. Um... Yeah, that's just cool. Did you really get a picture from a six-year-old girl? Oh, that's common. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Yeah, we get we get a lot of that, and like a lot of people like our my my, my nephew and niece uh, are big fans of Isaac, and they're five and three, and wow. people are like, you shouldn't be letting right. them see that game, but they fucking love it. <laughs> and like they they don't they don't. There's no way a, a little kid like that is ever going to understand why that game is disturbing right. and weird. <laughs> like they, they, they're never gonna connect the two that you know it, it's sometimes odd for my my nephew to say why does Isaac's mom want to kill him <laughs> like, that that's always a little it's like oh she's because she's she's a I don't, know. <laughs> uh, I don't know she's upset she's, she's mad at something um just sidestep that question there but like I don't know I mean I wish I wish I had something like Isaac when I was little like I had what did I have? I had a Little Shop of Horrors. I had Beetlejuice. Mm-hmm. You know, I had Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Like these kind of weird movies with this very dark edge to them, mm-hmm. and um, that's what inspired me and for me to make something that even gives a, a sliver of, of any of that stuff to anybody else is just awesome. I'm glad that uh, that you brought up the the, real, the obvious the religious overtones of the game. Have you had any blowback from your family in, in, on that at all? Like, well, I wouldn't know. Like the people that would be upset. The, the, the great thing about it, like I can say that a lot of uh, this is itch, oh, meh, yeah okay. I can say that a lot of the really darker imagery in the game I actually pulled from real stuff, mm. not that I experienced personally, sure. but that I heard happened. Um, Semi tied to the family stuff, and they would never admit to it. Like they would never call me on this. <laughs> like that's the beauty of the situation: is the people that would actually be offended by this in my family would never admit, you know, to these things. Yeah. Like I, I guarantee that the person that told me that I was going to go to hell would never even admit to it. I don't think they would see it. Like I'm just not, I'm not. That part of my family is cut off for obvious reasons, mm. and it just wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. But mm. I remember going in. I remember Danielle saying like really early on because there's always there's points like when I when I was developing I'm the kind of person that when I start working on something and it starts being it just starts flowing out you know and I try to be as honest as I can with everything and not censor what I'm trying to say or, or do and if it gets dark and weird and I start going like Ew, maybe I shouldn't say this that's when I know I should <laughs> like that's the point where I realize that I'm doing something that if I'm hesitant it means there's something of value there that needs to be explored. And there were many times where I was like, ugh, like this was maybe too dark. And usually what I'll do is I'll just counterbalance by making things a little cuter. <laughs> like it's it's the beauty of it is, is it's really easy. Like I've I've found a way to counteract, you know, really dark themes with really cutesy imagery and you know, it's easier to swallow. You know, it's easier to take because, you know, there's there's a still a part of you who's like not taking it that seriously. Mm-hmm. Because if, if I just went, you know, made like real, if it was all realistic and everything, it would just be the most depressing game that I've ever made yeah. and I wouldn't want to play it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, making it, I, I there was a lot of times where I was like, oh, I don't know if I should put this in, you know, and whenever I hesitated, I knew I should and I made sure I did put it in. And there was there was a, a time when I was a little worried, and I know Danielle is worried because, you know, the kind of people you don't want to fuck with are the are the religious people. 
Mm-hmm. You know, the, 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 the kind that would actually be offended by this are the kind you don't want to mess with because those are the kind that try to kill you and, you know, religion is the reason why we have wars. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the reason why people will kill each other. So, it was a little scary at, at some point. I will admit that it was like, wait, like, you know, I made a career for myself and I've been known to commit career suicide with some of the content in my games, which I do purposefully <laughs> just to keep myself in check. But in a way, I was doing that purposely. In a way, I was doing something that was very unbridled and uncensored and I knew that I might get in trouble for because I could. Like, because I wanted to keep myself in check and remember where I came from. And coming off of something like Meat Boy, which was more of a mainstream game and something that I really kind of, you know, I didn't have to play by the rules, but there was so much on the line that I should and I did. Mm. You know, I wanted to do something that kind of pushed the envelope and... I was worried that there would be some sort of backlash. But the more I thought about it, the more it seemed logical that there wouldn't be because the paths will never cross. You know, the type, the type of person who would want to murder me because right. I made a game that, you know, isn't exactly a, about, you know, how religion sucks or is bad or whatever else. It's more of a discussion. It's not me telling that, you know, hmm. religion is bad. But... Um, those type of people that would actually be upset by that don't play video games and will never know about it. Mm. That's just a fact. Yeah. And it's been almost a year and there's been absolutely no religious backlash whatsoever. The only, the only bump in the road was um, The Binding of Isaac was the first game to ever get a raised rating in Germany for blasphemy. Wow. Yeah, which was an, an honor in itself. But, <laughs> but the, the actual backlash came from that. Mm. Came from from that to the ESRB saying like, you can't do this. Mm. You know, how could you define what's blasphemous for one person and not another? You know, it's very specific to be blasphemous to a certain type of person and how could you raise a rating because of that? And they got a lot of grief for it and it got a lot of publicity in Germany for being the, the first game to, to kind of go through that. And it was a great topic of discussion, you know, and uh, it's great that that happened. Um, but Germany is not really... They don't want to tread on religious territory again <laughs> when it comes to yeah. offending people. Yeah. Especially the fact that the Binding of Isaac's also in the Jewish Bible and you don't yeah. want to... It's actually more prominent. I think, I think, um, I remember when I was searching around for it, it seemed more prominent there. But, um, yeah, Germans don't want to... <laughs> no. Don't want to... Play it safe. They're, they're playing it play, <laughs> play as safe as possible. I don't blame them. So, uh, yeah, that was the only thing. That was the only... Minor bump. Like I've gotten emails from pastors saying that they love the game, oh, wow. and that they like, they know that it doesn't portray religion in the best light, but that they really enjoyed it because in a lot of ways it's by the book. Like, <laughs> you know, it is. It's based on a story in the Bible, yeah. and and it's it explores that story in the Bible, and and it's not a literal translation because it's not the mother. You know, right. it's it's Abraham and. Uh, it's, it was fun to play around with the idea of is it the voice of God really telling her to do this? Because if it is, the Bible had the same story. You know, yeah, like yeah. if it really is, you know, God, God has been known to do this. Uh-huh. He has been known to test the faith of his followers by asking them to do atrocious, horrible things. And there's a, a cool little interaction there of like, is she crazy? Or is she not? And then, wait a minute, like, let me think about this a little bit. Like, you start to question that, like, there have been many stories of women murdering their kids because they heard God telling them to do it. Mm-hmm. It's surprisingly not uncommon. It actually happened, like, a week after the release of, of Isaac, which was strange because I got, like, a Google alert for it because they were referencing it to the Bible because she said um, that God told her to do it. And, creepy. <laughs> but uh, it was like, one of those points where I'm like, oh my god, does this have something to do with my game? <laughs> Why am I getting this? And uh, it was a bit frightening. And then I realized it's like, it's, you know, not remotely around here. <laughs> and and uh, it was frightening. But um, I think the game actually released in a, a, around a Jewish holiday where they would read the bi- story of the Binding of Isaac to mm. the family. Or that's, that's, you read that part of the Bible yeah. at that week which was kind of interesting because a lot of people are like, do you purposefully do this? I'm like, no, <laughs> it just kind of happened. But, 
but yeah, um, it was a fun little dance. Hmm. And, you know, there's, I don't know, like, if I didn't grow up religious and kind of had that dogma thrown at me, I wouldn't be who I am, yeah. you know? And um, I, I think the Catholic religion is very interesting. I think all religions are very interesting. And I think a lot of the creative imagery that they, you know, whoever wrote the Bible was pretty creative, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Especially, like, the later stuff, like, like Revelations. And that's some, like, crazy shit. Like, all the fire and brimstone stuff mm-hmm. was pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, and like even with, you know, in the Catholic religion, there's a lot of really ritualistic stuff that feels very D&D. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to play with that too. Mm-hmm. That's why all the characters in the game are based on D&D classes. So like Isaac's the fighter and Cain is the thief uh, okay. and Maggie's the cleric and Judas is the mage. All right. And that's how they're all balanced. And it's also coupled with tarot cards with the four suits of the tarot, right. which I also thought was really strange because each of the suits can also go with a, one of the main four classes in D&D. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the rituals in Catholicism are very clericky. <laughs> There's laying of hands, like all mm-hmm. that stuff. Like I grew up in a family where that was reality. Like where my grandma prayed, prayed the rosary and, and did a prayer of a safe passage whenever we went over the hill, like to go visit our cousins and stuff. My grandma would put a force field around our car and I believed it. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, that's, that's the sort of magic that I grew up with as a kid that was a positive you know, and of course there's the negative as well, but like, people always ask like, why is your work so dark? And it's like, I grew up with a picture of a dying man on my wall, <laughs> like <laughs> bleeding from his face, like in, in agony. And you think that I'm not going to be somehow inspired by that, especially when it's like, you look to that person as your God, mm-hmm. your God who like suffers for the world, like suffering and mutilation and self-sacrifice is godly. Like, how can I not you know, be inspired by that sort of stuff? It's pretty interesting too, especially when you think about Meat Boy and like that whole thing too. Yeah. A lot, a lot of, a lot of inspiration for my work, I think, comes from just religious stuff growing up. Wow. Well, um, uh, it's. I, I thought. I, I thought I read. I, I'm pretty sure I read at some point that it was there was a possibility that on my 3DS I could be playing The Binding of Isaac someday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that shocked me. Um, is that still in the works somehow? Sadly, I mean, maybe. Hmm. Um, we There's another company who wants to port The Binding of Isaac to consoles in handhelds. Mm-hmm. And this would be, this would mean remaking the game from the ground up yeah. <clears throat> maybe even remaking it in a game that like would look different maybe even play different I don't know and this is all in the air mm. but uh, they were basically originally saying like this would be perfect for the 3DS we're going to see if we can get approval from Nintendo it, you know just to make sure we don't like jump into this and then, then them have them put a wall up at the end and, and it went all through management and everybody was like saying oh it's looking good it's looking good it's looking good and then finally I guess like the highest of ranking person said that that it's just not what they want to associate with at this point in time because of the religious aspects and the mother wanting to kill the son sort of thing and um, it, which was odd because it wasn't a ratings issue because we already had ratings and we could get an M very easily you know it's not like we would get an adults only <laughs> um, <laughs> but sadly yeah they said they said no and um, but I'm not taking that as a no <laughs> I'm not ta- I'm not taking that as a maybe. I'm taking that as maybe that person once that person's not working in that <laughs> same <laughs> same level that maybe try again. But no, we're, we're gonna you know, as of right now, it's looking pretty good that there will be a console version of Binding of Isaac in the future, um, and I think that after the success of the game, I think maybe numbers will speak to these people sure. a little bit more than the content. Yeah. It'd be a shame not to, especially since it's like, if it wasn't for Nintendo, there wouldn't be a Binding of Isaac, so right. it would really be nice to have it on the system, and, and it seems just like all you have to do is slap a rating on it, and it would be fine. Um, but, I don't know. Cross that bridge when we come to it, I guess. Boom. Uh, well, I have to ask, since, since I have you here, 
Since you have me in my house. Since I have you in your house. <laughs> since you have me here. Th thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Ellen. Um, so, uh, uh, the little, I can't remember their names, even though they play during the credits all the time. I, uh, the enemy names. Yeah. The, the Skull guys who... Hosts. Hosts. Yeah. That may be inspired by a penis. Is that a penis? No, but... <laughs> <laughs> out of all the things that you can find, penises in my work, you'd... No. Yeah. There is actually no penis in that. No. Yeah. That actually comes from an older game that I did called Host, oh. and those were the characters from it. I see. There were balls of guts with skulls on top. Uh -huh. Their little heads would like jut out, like and like they hit hit they hit things with their heads. Right. And sometimes they would like lean back, and like a maggot would shoot out of its neck. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, those those aren't penises, okay. but maybe you'd be surprised. Right. I look back and think, oh, oh. Mm. they're all penises. Well, what about the vaginas? There's definitely walking vaginas. You'd you'd think so, but that would just be your dirty mind. Those are those are based on a character called the they're, they're bosses from Gish called the Visseran Sisters, and uh, they have slit open chests, and they open them up and spawn little demons out of them. And basically, I wanted to throw back to that. That's why they're called Vis. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, I see. And they just don't have heads. They have little... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can go there if you want. That's fine. But that's totally not me. It's totally you. <laughs> Man, I I'll, I'll, I'll go as far as just saying, if I want something to be a vagina or a dick, it's going to look exactly like Yeah, that. that's... Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get away from the fact that I... I I enjoy drawing fleshy, foldy, skinny, like skin hairy, you know, that sort of stuff's really fun to draw, so I draw it, and um, sometimes it looks like other things. <laughs> what are you going to do? Uh, man, I thought this game was deep, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the best comment I get is like, I think I, 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 I recently was watching some discussion of, I always, I always like uh, reading the ideas of what's the game about? You know, what's what's the big picture here? And all these crazy theories. Um, some of them are are pretty damn interesting. In a lot of ways, some of the earlier ones inspired later ideas mm. that I patched in. I was like, oh wow, I'd like to kind of explore that a little bit more because maybe I kind of was talking about that and I didn't wasn't completely conscious of it. And maybe I want to venture out into there a little bit more and touch on this, this, and this. And so I definitely read it. And I was reading some of the comments. And it's just like all this really deep stuff. And then finally he's like, you know, the game's just full of piss and shit. I don't <laughs> think there's much there. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how many times I get that kind of comment where it's like, you know, I don't think there's anything going on. It's just a bunch of fucking dick jokes and, and poop. Oh, my God. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 like, I like that in a way because <laughs> I like the idea of, of not sticking my nose in the air and sure, I'm too, I'm just, sure. I'm, listen, I'm discussing religion here, you know, like, <laughs> you know, let, let's break it down for you kids. Like, I, I grew up with stuff like the Toxic Avenger right. and like, if anybody watches the Toxic Avenger, like, there's a lot of stuff that they're talking about, like, there's a lot of truth and honesty in that movie that makes it great and make it, makes it Lloyd Kaufman's best film. Um, there's just like, you could see his hangouts about the idea of nuclear waste, you know, and how it's contaminating everything and corrupting people and how people are corrupted and, and how, like, an innocent person married with this, you know, apocalyptic fluid, you know, would turn him into this beast that can, you know, save the world or whatever. It's like this evil thing that... It, there's just a lot of interesting stuff that goes on, but no one ventures into that area and explores what he's talking about because, you know... It's a it's a movie where a guy gets his leg ripped off and beat with it, or you know, you know, a kid gets his head smashed by a car when they're trying to like score points for kids and all this other stuff too. It's like people like I just don't think that because there's really dark humor in anything um, that it's a throwaway to the substance, you know, what, what's actually there. But I get it a lot. It's just who I am, though. Like I'm, yeah. it's it's. I'm a sarcastic person with a dark sense of humor, but it doesn't make doesn't mean that I'm not serious in some way and don't think about these things. And I'm not a one-dimensional person, and my games aren't either. 
Like they're not one dimensional. I'm not going to sit down, you know, and like I said, stick my nose in the air and talk about religion. It's just not my style. So that's the way I do things. I put shit all over it. <laughs> I rub some poop all over it just to make sure people know, like, you know, life's not a fucking serious experience. Yeah. Um, so tell us or tell me, tell me what oh, you're interested in doing next or tell me what you're thinking about. What am I thinking point. about? What are you thinking about? What's on your mind? <clears throat> um, I'm thinking I really want to work with Tommy again. Cool. A lot. Hmm. Um, we we've been. When I say we, it's mostly him. He's been he's been reworking the engine for um, to do Super Meat Boy, um, the game, which is going to be. It's hard to explain this, but it's going to be a new game, um, custom built for touch devices. Huh? which is a retelling of Super Meat Boy. And it's going to be a way to us for us to abstractly talk about development through the game. Like, Super Meat Boy was an ex- abstract way of talking about our experience with video games through the game's design. Mm. Like, it was a big throwback to all those things. In this one, it's like, it's a whole new game. Everything is completely, completely new. The gameplay and everything. It's not going to play like Meat Boy, but it's going to have Meat Boy in it. Um, it's still going to be a, a Twitch Reflex game, but it's going to be custom built for the for the device, so it's not some shitty port with like buttons mount to the screen or whatever else. But um, what I feel inspired by, especially with the movie, which is also why it's called Super Meat Boy: The Game, like any game in the movie. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, is is there's I'm feeling a lot of inspiration about making a game about the process of making the first game, and not many people are going to pick up on it. In fact, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's not my goal to, for people to pick up on it. But me personally, that's how I work. I feel inspired by that idea and how it'll come out in the game. I'm not 100% sure, but that's kind of where I'm going with it. Like, I want to venture back into Super Meat Boy and talk about it in a way. Like, find new, new sides to it. It's probably going to be a lot darker. (laughs) But, um... There's a lot, a lot of images floating through my mind that feel very inspired and very, very cool, and I'd love to gush about them, but I need to, you know, not speak of it until it's actually happening. And right now, Tommy's finishing up the engine, and uh, we will be actually, you know, implementing gameplay features and stuff fairly soon. Um, and right now, I'm finishing up the uh, the basement collection, which is um, basically like director's cuts. Special edition director cuts of um, Spewer, Ether, and Timefuck cool. in a pack, and with a bunch of special features like all the sketchbooks and stuff that I had laying around for each of those games, and um, maybe some audio commentary. And each of the games will have like more content, you know, updated graphics and um, updated controls, and a bunch of like tweaks here and there to make them worth paying for. Because the whole, the initial name of it was the. It was the why would I pay three dollars for this because it's three free games pack, <laughs> which didn't <laughs> wasn't wasn't a, a big uh, didn't just didn't flow off the tongue like it yeah. <laughs> basement collection but um yeah like I needed you know I'm 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 not an idiot and I realize that there are three free games <laughs> that I'm asking for three dollars for and I'm going to make sure that I justify that that number it's three dollars so it's not a huge <laughs> deal but like. I I want to feel good about me purchasing something like that, right. so I want to really offer something substantial in terms of, you know, special edition director's cuts of each of these different games for people who are fans of these games or fans of my work and want to explore it, you know, in an ideal situation. Kind of sucks sometimes, like, like Time Fuck and, and Ether are two of my best games, and it kind of sucks that they're just like full of ads on some obscure yeah. website online. It just doesn't have, it's not exactly as I intended because I needed to pay the bills, I needed to get something sponsored, so there's a bunch of buttons all everywhere, you know, go to Armor Games, go to Newgrounds.com, and you've got to wade through some 15 second ad and, you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, at the very least, it's updated games without all the bullshit. Um, but at the most, it's going to be a lot of substantial material. Maybe couple extras Great. that'll unlock <laughs> cool 
we'll see. But I'm working on that with Tyler, who who um, was the programmer for Ether and also the programmer for Closure, um, which came oh, on the PlayStation yeah. Network. I haven't played that one. But is it good? Yeah, it's very good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 quite an achievement too. He's he's a very young guy and um, he started very young. He's very smart. Definitely knows what he's doing, and that will not be his last game for sure. Cool. Yeah, I. I it's funny that I had I saw a lot about that before it came out, and then I haven't heard much since it since it was released, which is. I'm not sure the release was handled as elo elegantly as mm -hmm. it could have been. I don't think many people knew that it came out. But, you know, downsides. Every every console has upsides and downsides. Mm -hmm. I've heard that Sony is pretty easy to work with, but they don't have the kind of audience that other platforms do. Right. So, they, they I don't know if they've perfected the... Um, they don't have the pull like Microsoft would or something when it comes to like putting something out there and getting a bunch of their audience to play it <clears throat> and I don't know if maybe it, it maybe it didn't get its fair shake I don't know I, I can't speak for them but yeah like every developer has a, a positive and negative it's it's sad too it's like with, with Nintendo we've almost I've almost made a game with Nintendo quite a few times <laughs> three times like I've almost made Ether I've almost made Super Meat Boy I've almost made Binding of Isaac with Nintendo and each time I always tell myself like the real reason I'm doing this is because it's Nintendo uh -huh. like, uh -huh. like that's and I and I want to be able to like I want to be able to do it one day like I like that's that's still a dream for me I remember Tommy and I used to talk about that back in Meat Boy development before things went got to the point where we couldn't put it on the Wii anymore um, we always said, you know, it's going to be really cool to have a Nintendo, you know, and we made a Nintendo game, like we made a, a game on a Nintendo console. And um, that n nostalgia factor is definitely still there, and I, one of the main reasons I really, you know, realistically, like, porting a game and putting it out there, I'm not going to make that much money off of it. This isn't about that, it's about, I want to be on a Nintendo console. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's cool. It's it's cool in the same way of like seeing your game in the stores for the first time. You know, it's cool to just see it on the shelves, even though realistically you're not really making any money off of it. Mm. Like we barely see any money from 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 retails, especially in the U.S., which is odd because I was always very weary of overseas stuff because it's like they could just screw me over. I wouldn't know. Like I'm gonna go to Germany. Like right. it's not it's not worth it. Right. Like <laughs> like. But those Germans pay. Like yeah. they're like the only publisher that like Head Up Games is the only publisher I've ever been paid royalties from. Wow. Ever. Like usually you just say, give me as much as you can up front because I'm not gonna see a penny after this because they can just the business people, they'll just be like, Well, we spent this much on marketing, we spent this much on this, or we took a loss here, 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 and until we recoup this, you're not gonna get paid. So you get as much as you can up front, which isn't a lot because retail sucks. Yeah. Like retail's really, really bad, especially in the US. And um, Head Up's pretty cool though. They, they, they want special edition stuff. They wanna make everything special. And I actually have, how much I can show you. This is like a big ad for, for, for Head Up Games. <laughs> um, Head up game. But they did both of these. So, and this is the reason why we did these. It's like, I'm not making that much money off of this. You know, maybe a few grand, mm -hmm. which is money. Yeah. I'm not gonna turn it down. But like, I'm also doing all the cover box art. Like, I'm like, I want to go in and say, listen, it's almost like Criterion Collection stuff. Like, listen, <laughs> yeah. listen, I created this. I want control over the box. I'm doing this so I can have these things. Like, <laughs> yeah. so I can have these in my hand. So yeah, having complete control over everything isn't isn't something that all publishers want because they're like we have professional it's like what am i right this is all i do <laughs> um but yeah i kind of like you know in a way totally got off on the idea of doing box art exactly the way i wanted and there's just certain things like like the inside um like i want to do special stuff like i i want i want a reason for fans because like nobody's going to the store and seeing this and being like Oh yeah, I need this. Like I've never, I don't know what it is, but this just looks so cool. Like you look on the back and the screenshots is like, there's no way in hell I'd buy this game looking at the screenshot. I don't know what the fuck's going on. But like, so this is for fans. And like knowing that, I wanted to go in and make sure that I made it for fans. So I went out of my way to do a, 
like uh, we did we did these promotional comics. Yes. You can see on the back there's there's a little <laughs> reach for the stars thing. Um, so I, I wanted to put together all basically all the comics and stuff that we'd done, and then I also wanted to do a sketchbook, like a little development sketchbook, and it was like all like these development sketches that I put together. Um, and it was just something that I like. I made this. I actually remember why I made this. I made this because I don't think I have that either, but. Um, Nintendo put out a, like an anniversary edition of like the Mario games mm -hmm. and and um, I didn't really it was on the Wii and I was like I already have all these games but what I wanted was the booklet that said it was like all these like special sketchbook stuff and it was like totally retarded it like, had <laughs> nothing it was like maybe like one or two sketches of Mario like I wanted all like I wanted like I thought this was like a treasure trove of awesome right. stuff and I was so disappointed I was like I gotta do something that won't let people down. Mm -hmm. Like, I gotta do something awesome. So we did this, went on my way and just threw this together for free. <laughs> then um, they said that they would do a poster. So this was like one of a few different posters that they, they published. Um, and, uh, and then they, I didn't even tell me, but they also did these, which were like little postcards huh. that they threw in. And we also put like, the soundtrack on the disc and a bunch of other special features. And I think it was like, we made sure that it was like DRM free, but also you got a Steam code. Mm. You know, just as, as much special stuff as we could. And we did the same thing with Isaac and this one just recently came out. Um, and for this one I was like, I hate it. I hate it when you get a DVD and like the inside is the same as the outside. Right. It's like, what, you know, it, how lazy is that? So I'm like, I want it to look like an old Bible or whatever. <laughs> and uh, so I, I use that and pop that out. And then for, for Isaac, I did a full sketchbook. So this is just all like the scraps of paper and stuff that I had, you know, laying around when I was doing Isaac of all the different characters, of all the different ideas for the three months that I worked on it. Put that all together and then we did this poster, which a fan did. I think no. I've seen this. Yes, I saw it on the blog. Yeah. That is the best. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah, a, a fan, a fan did, I'm like, oh my god, that's just so awesome. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, do you have that in high res? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, you want to put this in the in the retail list? She's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, go for it. I'm like, all right, we'll do, we'll do that. That's so great. So so that was awesome. And then like, it, co it comes with the soundtrack, of course, and that's amazing. and. Uh, it's all about, you know, when if you're doing retail, you got to give them a reason to buy these special things. And see, it sounded, sounded like a good reason. Let's, I'm basically like, the, my rule of thumb is if I like it, then I think somebody else will. So, and I think it's a good, a good rule, rule to go by. Like, I wonder if the inside cover sold this one. Yeah, we did this too. I hate it when the inside covers are just empty. So, we did a pull out poster. Oh, I saw that one too. A yeah, long time ago. that is so crazy. Dave Raposa drew that. He's like a Magic the Gathering artist. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, so you know, I I try not to do anything half-assed. Yeah. And the, this publisher is like the only publisher that we've dealt with that was was down with with investing a little bit of money to make some money, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sad thing is that our U.S. publisher still owes us like eight grand and won't pay us in like. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, I don't even think they exist anymore, honestly, no. but they are just like, you'd never think it, but in a way, I should have known, Americans, <laughs> <laughs> don't trust them, <laughs> they will fuck you over. <laughs> Germans, on the other hand, surprisingly, no. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well, okay, I have, I have uh, if we have time, I have two more questions for you, one very small in one sort of big-ish. Uh, one is, can you speak to the similarity between Meat Boy and the character Meat Wad from Aqua Teen Hunger Force? Yeah, I, I hope that was the short question. <laughs> that is the, that's the short question. Because the, the only thing that ties them together is the fact that they're meat, meat. but they're not. Okay. Because Meat Boy's not really meat in the same way that Meat Wad's meat. Right, right. He's just a skinless boy and Meat right. Wad's a meatball. Right. He's also retarded and Meat Boy's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't get very far as uh, Meat Wad if you were playing him in a game. Yeah. Um, cool. Fu funny story. Funny story. Funny story. When Gish was submitted to the IGF, 
the sponsor was Adult Swim, mm. and Adult Swim pulled us. They 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 were going to give an Adult Swim award where they would hire the team to make a game for Adult Swim. Um, this was years ago, two thousand four, and we were one of the developers they pulled in because they wanted to turn they wanted to reskin Gish as Meatwad, mm. and that was like a real <laughs> thing. And I thought that was kind of interesting, seeing as that people do th- throw out the whole like, you know, is there some connection between Meatwad and Meat Boy, right. other than the word. Meat. <laughs> meat and that's it well it's the same word Edmund yeah so, come on man um, <laughs> uh, cool uh, that was something yeah um, okay and so I guess maybe my final question is uh, knowing that you uh, you know have had these travails with publishers and, and, and larger gaming companies and knowing your feelings about all this what's What's, what's your future on consoles and things? Are, are, can you, are, is it, you know, are you... Like, am I through with you, Microsoft? Yeah, are you through with Microsoft forever? Or you... Yeah, that's, that's, that's a question that I think most people assume they know the answer to when mm-hmm. they're not right. Yeah. The, the realistic situation and a lot of the stuff that I learned in dealing with Microsoft and like dealing with business people, <clears throat> it's really easy, it was really easy for us to go in and take everything personal mm-hmm. because it was because it felt very personal it felt like these people knew who we were they knew that we were two guys they knew it was on the line yet they were still kind of fucking us why would they do something like this and when you're in that kind of mind frame it's hard not to get personal as well and be like you know i can't believe you're fucking awful people like you're despicable evil people but the reality of it is business and <laughs> the larger reality of it is the fact that I've learned from this, you know, I didn't learn in a way that I'm happy with and I wish I didn't have to learn that way, but I did learn that way. I got chewed up and spit out by Microsoft and I learned and because I went through that situation, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be against doing another game on their console. I simply know how to do it in a way where I wouldn't get fucked. Like I I know how to avoid the many dicks of Microsoft coming at me from all directions. Like, <laughs> you know, and, and that's not to say that they, that they would be down with it because they, maybe they don't want to fucking work with me anymore, but I think the reality of it is that they also see it as business. And if it's a business opportunity that we can both gain something from, um, I, think, I think we both, I th- honestly think we both have learned what to do and what not to do to people. Um, I truly believe that because of us being outspoken about what happened with Microsoft and the mistakes of you know the business department and marketing department, um, that a lot of people have been more critical of them. And because people have been more critical of them, they've changed their ways. And I know this for a fact because I get the secret emails that they send out that they don't know. <laughs> like they don't know that that every, all of us talk to each other. We all share the information, so we don't all get screwed. It's just, it's the way it works. And I know for a fact that burning our bridge, which is what people say, um, with Microsoft has helped many, many, many independent developers and gotten many deals, you know, and made, made Microsoft ease up and not being like, you know, you're not top dog anymore. You know, you, you're, you're losing steam. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're losing you're losing steam and there's a reason why independent developers aren't as eager to work with you um, there's a lot of hoops you got to jump through with that sort of stuff and honestly steam is just so much easier so much easier but that isn't to say that like the console version of Binding of Isaac that I would be against that publisher that's, that, that wants to do it going to Microsoft and asking them if they want to do it I'm, I'd be fine with that I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not going to have involvement in it. I'm not going to have to work with those fucking people again. You know, I'm not going to get screwed again. And even if me and Tommy were to do the next big game on an Xbox system, I know how to make sure the contract says this, 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 and this. You know, before, I was just simply too trusting because I saw these people as people and not as business, you know. I saw them as they wouldn't screw me over and promise me something, you know, vocally and then take it away a second later, you know, and I lose it. Um, you just don't assume that's going to happen. And you simply, if that was in the contract, I know that now, like it, 
if I had the knowledge I have now, back then, I wouldn't have been screwed because it would have just simply been in the contract that said, if you do this to get another promotion, you're guaranteed this spotlight, you know, this exclusive week, this price tag, you know, and so on and so on and so on. This this person will review it. All the stuff that they that they promised and ended up not delivering on would have been in a contract and they would have had to do it for the same way that we had to do things for our contract. But so much was happening so fast and so much was riding on it. You get tunnel vision and all you're seeing is just, I want to complete this game and let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. They're not going to fuck us over. And then in the end, you know, you get fucked and, and you're like, ah, like, <laughs> how'd this happen? <laughs> when, you know, you know, part of it was us not realizing that we needed to make sure that we get this stuff in the contract, which is why we were vocal about it. Like, which is why we, we talked publicly about what exactly happened, what exactly went down behind the scenes so other developers make sure that they get this stuff in the contract. When you're dealing with a big company, it's not a personal thing, it's business. And certain things might happen that screw you over. And the only way to prevent that screwage is simply getting a contract written with detailed information of exactly what is in the deal and what is expected of you and what is expected of them. But yeah, you, you live and you learn, you know? It was a crazy situation and um, it, it, it's sad that it got so tainted because like I mentioned, like working with, working with Kevin and working with Microsoft Studios, like working with our producers was great. Hmm. You know, it really was, like they all believed in us. It was simply these faceless business marketing people that were, you know, just the traditional evil villain that you see sitting in some like round table or something, you know, <laughs> plotting your demise. They don't care about you. Like they, they don't, you know, I, I remember there's, this is all NDA. I can't talk about it, but I can vaguely say that I remember being on a phone with one of these faceless people and them fucking me. Like I hear them <laughs> like, and I'm screaming for help and no one's helping. <laughs> it's like, why is this happening? Why are you doing this? You know, it, and it's, it comes down to, sorry, it's business and this is the way it has to be. Well, you know, I know that now and I've learned from the horrible situation and I'd like to think that maybe they did too. Um, but I'm not going to ever have to go through that again so I don't have to worry about it and the reason I talk about it is so you don't have to go through it again either. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not fucking whining about it. Um, you know, I'm not trying to diss Microsoft. You know, I'm using a fucking PC, guys. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, Microsoft does some great things, but, you know, I need to talk about these negative aspects so people don't have to suffer in the same way that we did. Um, and if it helps in any way, I'm totally down with taking a bullet <laughs> never working with Microsoft again. I'm fine with burning that bridge. If they don't want to ever work with me again, totally fine with me. All they are is another option to make some money. And that's the way they see me and that's the way I see them and that's the end of the situation. It's just the way it works. It's business. And it sucks that art and business have to collide in this shitty way. You know, it sucks that we can't just, you know, make good art and then be fine and not have to worry about money. But... The reality is that we do, and sadly, in order to be self-sustaining with video games, we need to learn a bit of business, and as shitty as that is, um, once you learn enough and you apply logic to it, it gets you pretty far. But it's one of the reasons why people don't consider video games art. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's bound to change as time goes on. It's just, it's just a matter of... Well, as long as you, as long as you just stay honest, yeah. that's what it's all about. The moment you start thinking about demographics and how to tap into markets and how to abuse your fans into giving you more money and how to like, mm -hmm. you know, there's just so, so many very, very easy ways to manipulate people into playing your game and giving you money. Um, I mean, it's akin to drug dealing, really. Um, same kind of strategy once you kind of hook people in and then you dangle the carrot there and, you know, you just give them logical situations where their brain's like, well, I could jump through all these hoops or I could just pay $5 and get the, what's, you know, promised to me after I jump through these hoops. You see a lot of that now and it's just horrible. Mm. It's all business and business just really has 
no business in art. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of why people, it's kind of why everything's shitty. I mean, you look at it like you can usually tie into shitty, shitty creative scenes and like video games in general. Like video games kind of suck right now because our market's bad. Mm. And when, you're mar when the market's bad, companies need to play it safe. And when you play it safe, all you end up doing is rehash, rehash, rehash because you, you can't risk you know, bankruptcy. Um, so you get garbage. And that's, that's how money works and that's how all that shit works. But luckily you've got independents who can live off of top ramen and egg like I did for many years <laughs> and uh, don't have to worry about that sort of stuff and make you know, honest, true art and expressive stuff and stuff that's just awesome and fun and new and innovative and and then the mainstream can copy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that um, they are, can continue to copy your work for years to come. Yeah, uh, the cool thing about my work <laughs> is I make sure that no one would copy it, at least <laughs> thematically. Like, yeah. I... I, I I like to make things that I know that like no one could touch with a ten foot pole. Yeah. Like no one's gonna, no one's gonna make some weird religious game about a little <laughs> naked boy who's running from his psychotic mother. <laughs> I don't have to worry about being ripped off. No one's gonna turn my game into the next Angry Birds. Well, you might have to. Worry but about me. Yeah. What about all those uh, fetus in a jar? Uh, fetus in a robot suit. Uh, oh, those are really popular yeah, these days. Yeah, you can't, you can't, I mean, you go through the mall and there's Come just on, fetuses in jars everywhere. <laughs> and all these little girls with fetus in a jar suits. <laughs> it's just, uh, just huge. Um, well, we should wrap it up there because we should wrap it up there. And that's that. That's a good way to I'm end the it. the boss. <laughs> um... Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to sit down with us and for inviting us into your home. It's thank you. Amazing. Thank you for being here. Yeah, you're welcome, man. It's been a lot of fun. And um, uh, all the best to you and, and to your games. And um, thank you for your contribution to the field. No problem. <laughs> I do what I can. Thank you, for, thank you for helping us have a voice. You got it, man. No worries. Cheers. Uh, thanks for watching State of Play again. Uh, we'll see you next time.